Uh, my name is Mary Jo. I'm with the Friends of the St. Paul uh, Public Library, and I'm delighted to be here. I've never been at this library. I'm a relatively new contract worker with the Friends, and what a great job for me at this point in my life. I love reading. Uh, the Fireside Reading Series is the Friends' longest running program. And I've heard that several of you have been here from the beginning. And at this point, you're at 29 seasons in partnership with this library. It's made possible by Builders Minnesota. There's a grant from the Metropolitan Regional Arts Council, and there's also a legislative appropriation from the Arts Fund, Cultural Heritage Fund, and we have a new sponsor, the Neighbors on the Street. Are you are you unmuted? Good question. If I don't, there's so many things that I need to pay attention to. The phone, the microphone, the phone is off. Good. Now we, I'm not starting over. Um, we have a new sponsor down the street. It's actually Minneapolis United. There's some coffee that we got from Ginkgo in the uh, right over there on the table. There are books for sale from Black Garnet, Black Garnet down the street, the bookshop. And um, Cleco brought cookies and delicious lime surprise treats that are also next to the coffee. So help yourselves. <laughs> I'm so grateful you're all here. We are all grateful for your support and being here. Uh, Carco's going to start with a reading and then he's going to open up with questions. And for the folks who are joining us online, Wendy's going to make sure that you people are included. So my experience with Carco is I've gotten to see him a couple of times at a place called Cheek Theater in Minneapolis where he does storytelling. And so when I learned he had a new book, I was delighted to read it. Uh, he is a professional baker, a poet, and he's, as you can tell, a Fitzgerald enthusiast. He's written for many publications in the Twin Cities, and he's promised, he's made me promise that I will not go through his entire resume on all the books he's written. So um, I'll just say for sure that he's written a cookbook for dogs and then three books of poetry. Welcome. I'm glad you're here tonight. All right. Thank you. Check, check. We good? Everyone can hear me, I trust. Well, isn't this nice? Uh, welcome to the capital city. Welcome to the library. Um, I'm excited to be here. Um, yeah. And we're streaming, streaming people. Hi, thanks for coming. Uh, I hope you feel like a part of the show. Um, and it's good that you're here. Uh, but this is uh, uh, the Fireside Series, and I might be the only food service person performing during this series, but there's other good people, too. There's writers, right? Um, there's a woman next to me. I forgot her name, but she looks kind of interesting. And then the week after that... <laughs> No, I'm serious. She's, she does a thing, and it's cool. But then the week after that, David Mura. I don't know if you don't know David Mura. Man, that guy, he's just been lighting it up for the last, you know, um, long time. Anyways, I have bullet points to introduce myself to you. Uh, my name is Klecko, and uh, I've been baking almost 45 years now, uh, mostly in St. Paul, but at other destination points across the world. Um, you know, I've been that we're in a library, well, something that I like to do, because I, you know, in addition, I don't really have many friends. I have a bakery with people I work with. I work six days a week. I'm in the middle of a 14 day stretch. So I don't really have time to have friends. But what I do do is I, go home and I drink cocktails and I read books. And I like books and I like cocktails, but let me tell you about the books. You know, that inspired me every time I do a show, because I have people that come to all my shows, I have like groupies, and uh, I don't ever want them to feel that they're gonna hear the same show twice. So I talk about different things that are interesting to me and hopefully interesting to you because books are very interesting. So tonight, real quick, before we start, this is the warm up. Um, I'm going to talk about four books that were very impactful. Maybe you've read them, maybe you haven't. But when I was a kid, you know, they made you read books when you're in elementary school. And in sixth grade, Mrs. Stuber 
um, found out that I was such a, um, a good reader that she said, Danny, come over to the adult bookshelf. And I got to go to the adult bookshelf. And she said, pick any one of these books. And I picked a book by this guy named Upton Sinclair, and it was called The Jungle. And little did I know, this was a book with Polish people like me. Little did I know, this was a book about a dysfunctional family like mine. And so it, it did, though. It, it, it changed my life. It changed my world. Um, and then the whole nation went bananas over a book called Jaws by Peter Benchley. And, and I read that. But it was, it was nice because back then in America, we didn't have a million different options. You had three options. And we all as a country witnessed them together. So Jaws was really cool. Two years after that, because I think Jaws might have been 71 or 72. And then two years after that, we went into Roots. And that was a guy named Alex Haley. And that changed our whole life. Uh, and what was so interesting about the book, it was hard because this was the first time as a, a, a kid, a, a white kid living in a primarily white neighborhood, we had to like get accustomed to different names. And, and that might seem silly to some people, but back then in the day, that was a thing. Uh, but then I, being that I knew that Alex Haley wrote that, then I read uh, a couple of years later, uh, the biography of Malcolm X that he worked on with. And then in 1991 or 92, I had a hammer, the story of Hank Aaron, which was tremendous too. Um, but with that said, the fourth and final week, I have a mom, single mom. She's the Polish one. My father was the Mick. He left in 65. So we were raised not to celebrate leprechauns or four leaf clovers, stuff like that. But my mom said, Danny, it's very important that you read women writers. And so she turned me on to a book called If You Want to Write by Brenda Euland. And Brenda said to Danny, young Danny, Danny, you get to do whatever you want. You can do anything you want. And it's perfect. And I did what she said. And now I'm famous. Um, <laughs> all right. With that said, I'm going to talk tonight. You were kind enough to come out. Uh, I'm going to talk about this new book. It's called The Dead Fitzgeralds. It's called The Dead Fitzgeralds. You guys got to do the heavy lifting because these people, they were applauding at home, right? Anyways, yes, they are. And, uh, but it's important. You know, I, you know, tonight, I really because we're at a library, not a bookstore, I really want to make sure um, that when I'm talking to you, uh, we're, we're talking to citizens, not consumers. This isn't necessarily about you trying to get you to go out and buy my book or to give me money. I don't want your money, but I want you to read the book. It's an important book. I mean, if, you're, if you have any love for the city of St. Paul, this book is mandatory. Um, <laughs> yes, thank you. Uh, but the book is filled with cameos. It, it's filled with cameos. Who do we have in here? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> Robert Bly is in this book. Boy, I remember back when you had to say Robert Bly and people would applaud. But yeah. you die. Look what happens. <laughs> All right, Gloria Steinem does a cameo. Now here's, here's gonna be the interesting one because very respectfully I'm in this camp but we have people in here of a certain age, but I don't know, do any of you know who Henry Rollins is? Yeah, yeah. so the front man from that Black Flag. And what's interesting, if you were an original punk rocker, you're on social security now. I just figured that out, <laughs> but he's in the book. Sinatra does a cameo in the book as well. Anyways, but probably more important than any of those people, if you flip the book on the back, it's endorsed by the greatest writer that's ever come out of the capital city, Patricia Hampel.
she basically says, and I'm paraphrasing, Klecko is the greatest thing that's ever happened. If you haven't read Klecko, you haven't lived. That's basically what she says. <laughs> In this book, you get a personalized tour of Summit Avenue, F. Scott Fitzgerald, Sinclair Lewis, Garrison Keeler, Carol Connolly, who's the focal point, the only poet laureate that the capital city has had. And then Carl Weske, who's the publisher, was the publisher of Llewellyn Books, the largest metaphysical Woo! publisher, right? Well, you may or may not know, St. Paul has a long history with the occult. And, and I think I, I shocked some people because, you know, when you're in hospitality, I roll with everybody. <laughs> but, you know, my first book tour, the Dog Biscuit Cookbook, I mean, I was hanging out with the witches because the witches <laughs> party a lot more than the poets. So, <laughs> note to self. Um, my most, uh, I, I've learned from crawling down this uh, Fitzgerald rabbit hole, there's two kinds of people who uh, approach F. Scott Fitzgerald, and that's the people who enjoy Fitzgerald's work, or then there's the people who are the Gatsby nerds. So, it's, uh, you know, when I meet people, I'll say, are you Fitzgerald or are you Gatsby? And, and you get all kinds of different things, but the Gatsby people, I'm telling you what, it doesn't matter if you're up at the bar or if you're in the pew at church, you start talking about Gatsby and bring up the green light. And my goodness, you're gonna hear every interpretation on what that green light means and what it's all about. But I'll tell you, most of you are wrong. The green light originated in St. Paul and when you buy the book, you find out where it came from. All right, but most of all, the most important reason to check into this book is it's a unique love story. It's a story about my love for Carol Conley. And when you have a woman who's 80 plus with a young, handsome man who's 45, successful, strong, you know, it, it, it's, it, it, it's beautiful because, you know, because of the chasm of age and, and uh, positions in society and marital status, all these different things, you know, it, it was really interesting for me to fall in love with a woman where there was no amorous uh, things, you know? And over the years, Carol Conley, who is referred to as the Duchess in this book, I'll tell you flat out, she grew to love me and understand me better than either one of my wives, better than either one of my kids, better than my mother. We had a unique bond that uh, was just, I'll never be able to replace. So that's why this book for me is everything she passed during the pandemic. So that's kind of when I got to business, brass tacks, as we say. So now what I'm gonna do, when I go to these things, I don't like when they read too long because sometimes they do that. <laughs> I don't. So I'm gonna do like two like things. This is thing one and it's gonna be fairly brief. And the setup was, this is when Connolly basically adopted me. i have been going to her program and, uh, but then she made me come to her writing classes and stuff. I've, I've never gone to a group with writers in my life, you know, uh, uh, no offense. Um, I hang out with hospitality people, but she made me hang out with these writing people. So I hung out with them and we wrote things. But then one of her friends, this friend who was the, the niece to uh, 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 Eugene McCarthy, who was also divorced from Peter, from Peter, Paul and Mary, she calls me up and she says, Klecko, I want to commission you to do a poem for the Duchess's 80th birthday. I said, yeah, I'm there. And then she said, oh, by the way, bring a cake. So that's kind of like <laughs> how that works, right? <laughs> Anyways, three, two, one. 
the party took place in a Lux condo on the 400 block of Summit Avenue. I was instructed to be early. After setting up the cake, I watched the guests file in. Eugene McCarthy's niece, the ex-wife of Peter from Peter, Paul and Mary, whiskey moguls, hotel tycoons, a state senator, an attorney general, all surrounding me and the lemon cake. Waiting with apprehension, waiting for the guest of honor, when the Duchess eventually arrived, the crowd cheered like Protestants. Before breaking into song, when the room became quiet, Duchess looked at me and asked, Lemon? I nodded yes. She signaled for the caterer to step forward and cut the cake. I waved my hands, explaining serving the Duchess was my honor. Turn the page. When dessert was finished and plates were cleared, the cups were whisked away. The host called for order, explaining that in addition to being a premier baker, the cake guy was also a fine poet, as well as the Duchess's protege. That comment struck me with the force of a sledgehammer. People sat down, people sat forward, People leaned back and smiled. As the obvious became clear, the Duchess was using this day, her milestone birthday, as a coming out party for the young man she adored. Wow. I read my poem. I read my poem. I read my poem entitled Girl Cake. I get excited. Girl Cake. And they're all staring. Girl cake. Nobody understands the thought process of women on the anniversary of their birth quite like the village baker. <laughs> For he has set. 1,000 cakes before the fair species, and he has deduced what the majority will miss. Women aren't thinking about the arc of their life, the losses they have suffered, or how many candles are blazing. She simply wants dessert. Thank you. And, and then these people who are much more famous than you, you know, were like screaming and cheering. And, and I got all nervous. I got all nervous and I went in the back and started washing dishes because I didn't know how to socialize. Um, so this book, The Dead Fitzgeralds, I toured it. I launched it in Montgomery, Alabama. I launched it at the Fitzgeralds Museum. I lot, which happens to be an Airbnb. I was fortunate enough to stay in there and I got to sleep. Many people don't know the Fitzgeralds by this time were sleeping in separate bedrooms for whatever reasons, but I got to sleep in Zelda's bed for two nights and we'll have stories about that at the cocktail hour. But um, <laughs> what was interesting when I was going down to Montgomery, there's a lot of the nation's top scholars down there. There's this one cat, his name's Kurt Kermit, and he's, uh, he's like the guy, the guy. I'm sure there's like that guy, but he's the guy. And so I wanted to bring him something that was impressive, but he has everything because he's been doing this Fitzgerald stuff forever. I just you know kind of got into it and I baked bread. But I thought, I know what I can do because I read this book called uh, St. Paul Fitzgerald Stories, right? And there's, uh, it talks about the neighborhood that I and Trish live in, Patricia Hampel. Um, and there's an alley that she actually lives off of. I won't give you her address, uh, but it's called Maiden's Lane. And Maiden's Lane, actually, you can have your own little addresses for the alleys. It's the only alley where uh, you can have an address. And so they're Puritan pavers. 
And, and they, these were the top pavers made in the world. And, and I give you a whole background, an interesting background on Puritan pavers. So what I did is I liberated, I liberated a Puritan paver and I put it, and because when I fly, I fly light. So I had it in my carry-on. And when, they, when I went through TSA, they profiled me. Can you imagine? And so I'm standing there with the TSA. My publisher was on this flight, and she'll tell you. And they were like looking at me saying, you have a brick. And I said, yeah, but it's for important people. And they said, well, get the supervisor. So there was a big meeting about the brick. And I told the supervisor, I'm kind of an important guy, but I'm going down to Alabama. It's just, swear to God. But these people are like, they're like architects and stuff like this or whatever, and they're smart. And so I need to bring the brick. And they said, it could be a weapon. I said, these could be a weapon, but you know, I'm, and then she laughed and they let me go. So I bring them down. We get to the thing. I do the thing. And that guy is there and we talk and stuff. And I give him the brick and I tell him the story. And he says, you know, Clacko, just down the street is Fitzgerald Park. And they have this big fountain. And they smash up the first one because they're building the second one. And there might be some bricks laying around. So me and the guy who I gave the brick, <laughs> we liberated <laughs> this built, uh, brick from the Fitzgerald Fountain. <laughs> Anyways. You could applaud for that, I guess. <laughs> so did I tell you? I am declaring I'm the self-proclaimed Fitzgerald guy. You know, everyone else had their chance. And now it's my turn. I'm taking over Fitzgerald. If you're in the capital city, if you want to know about Fitzgerald, you come to me. Why? Because I know the beautiful people, and I'm going to send them, send you to them so you can talk to them. The public library system has been gracious enough, gracious enough to, to let me sidle up to them and put together some programs that pay homage to the short stories of F. Scott Fitzgerald. And what I'm trying to do, I'm trying to do it a little bit different than they've done it for the last 100 years. I'm trying to make it inclusive. I'm trying to make sure people of all economic backgrounds, all different races, genders, whatever, everyone isn't going to uh, uh, you know, feel left out. They're all going to be asked. I mean, I've already started the pro uh, program. We had a, a queer uh, Fitzgerald show at the university club where I brought up uh, non-binary person that came up and uh, did their um, Gatsby thing. And, and you know, sometimes it, it rocks the boat for people who are traditional, and I get that, and I'm respectful to it. But my fear is that this whole new world is not going to see the beauty of Fitzgerald and the beauty of my city if we limit it to thoughts and ideas of the past. So if you want to come down to uh, the Friedel Gallery and Studio, on April 13th at 6.30, and we'll talk about this later. We're gonna be talking about Bernice Gets a Bob, and it's gonna be hosted with the gallery owner, Heather, who is uh, Native American, and uh, I think a national snow sculpture champion, and rock star chef J.D. Fatsky from the strip club Meat and Fish. See, normal people talking about beautiful stories, and we'll let other people. Um, now I'm going to bounce back to the book. So this is the hard part. I didn't know I was being groomed. Maybe she didn't know she was grooming me until she knew. But the Duchess started losing her mind. She started, dementia was coming. In. And you know what I've learned? When people start getting dementia, especially short little mean Irish women, sometimes people like to look the other way because people get angry when they're going through this process. And so I was kind of selected to usher my friend all the way until pandemic 
um, took her away from me. But this is just a few pages. As per usual, we were early. So after checking in with our event host, I escorted the Duchess outside across the parking lot to the top of a steep bank that dropped far and fast to a river that was partially screened by clusters of leafless trees. The ground was slick. Over the past couple of days, snow fell heavy, then melted fast. The pattern continued enough where a practical pioneer would have come equipped with Sorrells. But I was wearing Florsheim loafers and the Duchess sported wedge pumps and I think they were Kate Spade. We stood close to each other with our back to the building and our gaze set over the river. This was the moment I began to understand. The Duchess began to move forward. Her footing still remained in a place of safety, but I became nervous and lovingly pulled her close to me. It was as if that very moment, that very instant, she had aged to a new increment. It was the first moment where I thought of her as old. As we stood, we remained silent. Part of the time, her eyes looked empty until the emptiness shifted, turning into a disoriented glare. Then just like that, she'd snap out of it, issuing wisecracks. But then the silence returned. And I could tell from her facial expression that inside her mind, she had to ration abilities that helped her to get through, to present herself in a measure she desired. But this had to be draining because when her guard dropped, it wouldn't become uncommon for her eyes to drift like pinwheels at the moment without wind. One more page. Moments before we returned to the venue, Duchess put her hand on my elbow while declaring, it would be nice to see the river. But all these needless trees blocked our perfect view. And then she paused before lowering her tone and continuing, there will be a point with you and me where you will need to forget about words and focus on intuition. Sometimes my mind gets filled with distractions that force me to lose focus. These distractions sometimes make me choose words or ideas I normally wouldn't consider. I realize I'm asking a lot. I don't even know how intuitive you are. But it was at this point, I took her hand, turned her around, and told her I was raised by my mother, the mystic, and intuition happened to be one of my superpowers. <laughs> Warmth returned to her grip. Soft smiles blossomed only moments before the Duchess won over another audience. Thank you. So, what a compelling book. Uh, <laughs> we're getting to a point where they're gonna like pressure me to answer questions. And so I'm gonna do that, but I, I'm, I'm, I have a plant in the audience, my publisher, Julie Fissinger. Julie, raise your hand. <laughs> Paris Morning Publications. Um, Publisher to the rock stars, who's kidding who? Um, <laughs> Julie, do you remember the plant question I asked you to ask? Could you stand when you ask the question, please? I, 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 yep. Aside from Epstein Fitzgerald, who is your favorite writer? Oh, oh my gosh. <laughs> what a great question. I'm going to repeat every question that's asked tonight. 
other than F. Scott Fitzgerald, who is my favorite writer from St. Paul? You know, it's interesting you should say that because my favorite, you know, I lean towards poets and my favorite book of poetry that's ever been written is a book called Resort by Patricia Hampel. And <laughs> swear to God, I'm not just saying it because I adore her and love her. I'm telling you, it's the best book of poetry I've ever read. The first part, it has poems, you know, like poets do. Let's write a poem. And she wrote poems. <laughs> but the second half, it's like a freaking opus. It's called Resort. And I'm telling you, it changed my world. I've ordered, I, I'm telling you, I, I order them. Sometimes I get, have drinks. And I go online and I, or I've got copies laying all over my house. It's a perfect thing. But just to prove to you, because some people might say, oh, yeah, but, but nothing. Check this out. This is a book, a debut book of poetry called Woman Before an Aquarium by Patricia Hampel. I'm just going to give you a little sampler. Three, two, one. St. Paul, walking. The old city of saints opens its hand against this morning. Its claw of money and glass rosaries. I never say no. Together, we have broken bread, promises, Hearts, whatever drags beneath our muddy river. I put my bare hand on the red stone of the millionaire's house. It sizzled like water in a black pan. Sometimes I think I will hold forever the hand of this city, it shakes its fist of beer and greenhouses at me. Its long death sways on the stem of an orchid, even in winter. Kaboom. <laughs> Church Ample. Church Ample, come on. You know. Mary Ann Grossman's been writing for the Pioneer Press for 150 years, and you talk to her, and she'll tell you the biggest debt we've ever received is people in the capital city. That she could have let New York wander. New York tried to take Tampa away from us. She stayed. She stayed for you, but mostly she stayed for me. <laughs> All right, uh, how do I do questions? Do I just say, do we have any questions? Do we have any questions? <laughs> All right, who's who? Who? who uh, it's a good question. Yeah. Okay, go. Well, I appreciate the book. I, I have quite a poster, but I really enjoyed it. Uh, I, I'm a recent, uh, you know, I've been in St. Paul about 20 years, but I, I love it. Uh, I love it a lot too, and I spent some of the time with it. You know, I'm like you, uh, I've kind of. Okay, question. What's the question? Yeah, right. Get to it. Yeah. Times. <laughs> Are there any theories why we don't have an F. Scott Fitzgerald Museum? Yeah, there's a theory because people don't care enough to do it. Yeah, I mean, it's just that simple. I mean, it should have been done years ago, and every day we wait, it's harder. And that's why I dedicated uh, this book to the people of Montgomery, Alabama, for getting their act together and putting the fish. But down there, I got to tell you a secret. They kind of like Zelda more than Scott. So I'm not saying it's out of the question, but if people want to do the right thing, I'm only going to be around this much longer. And after I'm dead, you're out of luck. Next question. Yes. Are they still teaching uh, Fitzgerald in high school? Are they still teaching Fitzgerald in high school? Uh, I see people nodding their head. Yes, I've heard yes. Uh, Trish, do you have any thoughts on that? She says no. She doesn't know. No, you don't have any thoughts, but do you have any accurate data? No, no. No one has accurate data. You do. In Stillwater, we're reading The Great Gatsby, which is beautiful. Um, any other questions? 
Oh, the internet. Hi. Our Zoom audience wonders where you're reading and performing next. Well, I'll tell you where I'm reading and performing next. If you want to come down March 10th to Asheville, North Carolina, The Dead Fitzgeralds is part one of a trilogy of Fitzgerald books. Zelda's Bed will be number two on the 75th anniversary of the death of Zelda. Klecko will be the keynote speaker for all the important people who come on. Come on down you, and tell me, you'd say, I'm your friend from the internet and I swear to God, I'll buy you a cocktail. Uh, next question. <laughs> Any more questions? You know, I was here last week and the other person's book was good, but this one maybe a little bit more. And, and they asked her a ton of questions. You guys, come on, help me out. You in the red shirt. Yeah. Why do you write? Why do I write? You know, it's an interesting question. And, and I think, I, you know, and, and I hate to give you the answer because I have to. I mean, I've been doing it. Yeah, when I was a kid, I didn't have friends. I was socially retarded. And, and, you know, I had to see counselors and stuff like that. I was a selective mute. I spent a lot of time by myself. So I would write and still, see, when I come up here, it might sound like I'm comfortable with you people. I'm not. I, I mean, not at all. This is just a persona. I don't even give you my real name. I tell you, I'm Kleckler. You don't even know who I am. But I've been doing this my entire life. And I find that all these other people that write, I, other than Trish are kind of a little bit mixed up too. <laughs> Trish is straight, but the rest of us, and it's kind of a nice community. We, we help each other, we work with each other. Um, what else do my friends from uh, Hollywood have to say? The internet. <laughs> oh, question. Tell me the reason, uh, if you haven't read the book yet, there's every, every few pages there's a Roman numeral, and you write a narrative poetry, which is really, easy to read, it's wonderful to read, no comment. But my question is about the, the Roman numerals. What, what do they signify? Well, the, the question is that Klecko has his own writing form, okay? And people often wonder why I don't use punctuation. It's because I don't know how to use punctuation. <laughs> I went to three different high schools. Like a bad ball player, I got moved around. I never graduated high school. I've worked my entire life. And then I read these poems by Robert Bly. And I learned from him, every sentence starts with a capital. And then so that's what I did. I started that form. But then as I got older and progressed to a higher level, this was like after I won major awards, um, <laughs> I started. Every one of these should be read as a poem individually. You can read any one, you can read page 72 and it will be complete on its own, but compiled, it's like a thing, right? So that answers that. Uh, next question. Yes, yeah, sir. Or no, I, no, you already, you, how about, yeah. I want to ask if you'll get a brick when you go to Asheville. <laughs> well, you know, sometimes the question was, will I get a brick when I go to Asheville? I have a tendency to fondly liberate items that want to come. I have a menu from the Owl Bar at the Belvedere in Baltimore. I have things off of the grave of the Fitzgeralds. I have things. And because I have poker chips from Montgomery, Alabama, from Zelda Suite, you know, I don't try to liberate things that will be missed but I try to liberate things that I can bring into the world and share with people who love F. Scott Fitzgerald because I don't want to ask, you know, does that make sense? Well, you know, let me tell you, in the hospitality industry, I've gotten so many things by bribing people, to be quite honest. You bribe in the hospitality industry, but the one thing you learn, you know, you talk to, have you ever been to prison? Okay, you talk to people who've been to prison and you ask them, what's the one thing that's the best thing to do to never go to prison? And they say, never tell people what you're going to do before you do it. So am I going to get a brick uh, from North Carolina? Um, no, I don't think so. All right. <laughs> Any other questions? Is that it? Is that it? Really? Question. question. Know 
So the question is, this uh, comrade has said to me that they have been and seen Klecko in the kitchen as opposed to Klecko in literature land. And have I ever brought in literature into the kitchens? Heck yes. You know, because they need it. Currently, I'm on Facebook, Danny Klecko, but I, I'm on this thing. It's called Baking Memories. And I'm writing little one page essays. Many of you have read it, many of you are enamored by it. It's probably the greatest work because it goes over my entire legacy. I've got the top chefs. And it's interesting because as much as I used to be powerful, I used to be somebody, but I'm telling you, in my industry, you know, you, be, you get old, you get wiped out, man. So now I'm clinging on for paychecks, just honest truth. But the people that next generation have been so gracious and they're showing me respect and they're taking these things and they're helping me uh, because they want to be a part of something. And I'm featuring all the people from, you know, my history in the baking career to the top restaurant tours. Uh, and the one thing that's interesting about Klecko, you're going to see more diversity. I've been doing diversity before that even became a thing, because when you work in the kitchen as a white man, I mean, you are a minority. Because you want to know something, the people who work in kitchens, they don't work in kitchens because they want to work in kitchens. They work in kitchens because they have to, because people don't love them, because they don't have money for college. But then we had this Anthony Bourdain thing, and then you had a generation of kids who paid $250,000 for their culinary career to quit in 18 months. That's the history of uh, food service. Yes, sir. Yes. <clears throat> ask the question again. You're a great writer. What picture of the first baker? Well, this is a great question. I am a baker, a great baker who writes, was Fitzgerald a great writer who baked? There is no records that have shown him, but you know who was? John Lennon. When John Lennon moved to the Dakota Hotel, he hung up his guitar. And for five years, all he did was bake loaves of bread. And he, when, it, when people would come, he'd give them the loves of bread. His quote, which is in my book, Lincoln Land, Lincoln Land. The quote is in the book where John Lennon says, baking a loaf of bread is something that even a beetle can be proud of. <laughs> Anyways, John Lennon, how are we doing? Yeah, I think, I think we're about, about it. Is that it? Final, we final, final wrap it. Okay, well, we're, this is, uh, I'm being told by my boss, uh, Wendy Worden. And by the way, you know, Wendy Worden does so much for this series. She, and she's here week after week after week doing everything, setting up, breaking down the whole thing. And you know, I come from hospitality, not literature. I see literature people, they just go on. And they, if you're in hospitality, you go over and you say, thank you, I appreciate this. And you thank the people in the library. It's only the proper thing to do. <laughs> But as I wind down the evening, the greatest thing you can do, and I, all kidding aside, don't even buy my book. Go online, go to a library, do whatever it takes, and find Trish Hample's resort and read this book, and it will change your life. My name's Danny Klecko. Thank you, St. Paul. Good night. Let's have uh, let's have another round for um, Ms. Hempel because <laughs> one for Danny. Nobody has ever read that little poem from my Cleopatra <laughs> called Salad Days. When I was a kid, I wrote that poem. Nobody has ever read that so that I heard it. Oh, thank you. Read oh. Salad Days, the poem. <laughs> <laughs> thank you all for being here. Thank you, Danny Klecko, for coming. And thank you so much to the Hamlin Midway Library. There are books for sale on a little table back there. And the wonderful Wendy is, has the ability to take money. Um, if, you, if you enjoyed what Danny uh, Klecko had to say tonight, join him in April at the Freed Lee Gallery and Studio. And you already talked about this. Did you? Again. Okay, Freed Lee Gallery and Studio right on West 7th. 
Kagan Kagan case. You seem much more familiar with it when you said it. So that's why I brought it up. And the cool thing is, is you can chat about generational rebellion. That never stops as it's featured in Fitzgerald's <laughs> short story. So um, Klecko is going to be joined by a sculptor, Heather Friedley, and a chef. Pronounce his name for J. us. J.D. Fretzky. J.D. Fretzky. Chef of the so, year, Minnesota Chef of the Year 2018. Come. It's on, uh, let's see, it's in April. What day in April? Yeah, it's Thursday night. Thursday night. Okay, well, a couple because months from Wendy now. Because Warden says the best night to go to a show is Thursday night. Well, okay. And Wendy would probably say, too, come back next week. Because we're going to have Diane Glancy here, and she's going to be talking about her book, Home is the Road. So thank you again so much for being here. And come up and give homage or go over near the coffee and have a spritz cookie or some of these little white things that have stuff inside them that he made. <laughs> They've all been made by Klecko. So thank you and good night.